As always, it's a great pleasure of mine to be before you, especially on such a beautiful Lord's Day. I want us this morning to think about a few things that I think oftentimes we take for granted because we, I would say, grow up around them. And these are spiritual matters that we see physically oftentimes. But as far as, far as introductory remarks, would like to point out that, and we know these things, but there are certain things in existence that God has not joined together. One example of this is the truth of God being joined with the doctrines of men. God has not joined these two together. However, there are many things that God has indeed joined together. What that means is those pairs are inseparable. You cannot divide them. God has joined them. Now this is in spite of man's efforts throughout time. Things that God has joined, man has no authority to alter in any way. Matthew chapter 19, verse 6, the latter part of that verse, What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, this is not a suggestion. This is not advice. This is a command. This is something we need to be aware of. Now those who would attempt to tamper with these God-joined things are guilty and without repentance will ultimately lose their soul. Revelation chapter 22 verses 18 and 19. Thankfully, we can know about the things that God has joined together. For he has revealed them to us in his word. Therefore, as his creation... We must, we must respect our Creator's authority. Thus, we must respect His Word. Specifically, for us today, the Lord's last will and testament, the New Testament of Jesus the Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, and Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Likewise, we must also respect and uphold the work of God and oppose any who would oppose that work. Titus chapter 1 verses 9 through 13. <clears throat> Our first topic of interest of things that God has joined together that man must not divide us under is the bond between husband and wife in a scriptural marriage. <clears throat> We see in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 25, shortly after the creation of man, that God ordained the marriage institution. Jesus, our Savior, hearkens back to this account in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, as well as Mark chapter 5, or 10, verses 5 through 9, to teach God's original plan or pattern for man and woman in marriage. You see, God would join both the male and the female together. This marriage union is holy and must not be tampered with. This includes by in-laws. This would be by any other man or woman, outside forces. And obviously it would include the husband and wife themselves. None of these have the authority to tamper with God's marriage union. There are those today, however, who have been attempting to destroy this institution, this union of marriage. 
One way that that is done is by pushing homosexuality. See, they're attacking the very pattern for marriage. Instead of one man and one woman, it's two men or two women or different numbers. You have polygamy. And then nowadays, you'll, some folks don't even know what they are. And they're looking for something that they don't even know what is. So there's so much confusion nowadays. But there is a pattern that we must look to and follow. You consider feminism. Now we're not talking about women's rights. While those are good. Think of the evils that have come from that movement. Feminism in our day has been successful in at least two things. And we've seen this in this, quote, transgender movement. The masculating of women, that is, women thinking they're men or trying to be men, whether in thought or physical, as well as the feminization of men. Men acting as if they are women whether in thought or in action. Some are so mixed up that they have no idea what they are. And that's a sad state of affairs. And ultimately, these type of people are either going to push their theology or their philosophy on others, which we're seeing, and eventually they're probably going to make what they would call a marriage bond. Is that following the pattern? Are they following the pattern that God has set forth in his word? You see, God has not authorized anything other than one man and one woman to marry. This would also attack children marriages. See, Adam was not a baby when he married Eve. She was not a baby when she married Adam. They were mature mentally and physically. They were able to be what is expected of a husband or a wife. Now, the different things that we've just mentioned, these such unions are abomination before God. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, and Jude verse 7. Thus, each of these unions are sinful. 1 John Chapter 3, verse 4. They go beyond what God has set forth. Now we must realize, going back to the pattern, that there are only few, there are only certain types of people that are qualified to marry, that have God's authority to marry. First is those who have never been married. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28. The second class would be those whose spouse has died. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. And third, those whose spouse was put away scripturally because of their fornication. Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Not the guilty party, not the one who has in fact committed fornication while in that marriage union, you see, these people do not have God's authority to remarry or to marry to begin with. Now, although the world around us would scoff at the idea of fornication and adultery, God does not. Therefore, we should not as Christians. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, and Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Any who would attempt to alter this pattern to change or put asunder God's plan, they're guilty of sin. And as the Lord's army, we should defeat that sin through proper teaching of the gospel of Christ. Secondly, man must not, nor can he, put asunder, divide Jesus the Christ and the church. You see, many today live as if they only want Jesus without the church. Some would even claim that they can be a Christian without the church. Now, by believing this claim, they attempt to decapitate the head from the body. 
For we know that Jesus is the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. And he is the Savior of the body. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Thus it is impossible to have salvation outside of Christ. It is also impossible to have Christ without the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 7, which both read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, where? In Christ. Verse 7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Jesus is the founder and builder of the church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He loved this church and ultimately gave himself for it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It is in that death that he purchased the church with his very blood. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. We see from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, that the fullness of Christ is located in the church. There it reads, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Thus, there are no spiritual blessings in Christ that are outside of the church. All of the saved are both in Christ and in his body, the church, the body of the saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, verse 41, as well as verse 47. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Those added to Christ are also added to the church at the same time. John chapter 3, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. You see, God never joined Christ with Roman Catholicism. God never joined Christ with any denomination. Most of the world thinks that he did. Look at how many different denominations we have. How many splinters. Look at the different community churches who really aren't much of a denomination. It's a sugar cube sale. Come in, pay their money. Get some sort of sugar-coated gospel, if you want to call it that, and they go away happy because they've had their conscience salved. Christ was never joined by God to any other religious body than the church. No saved person has ever been added to either of these bodies, nor will they ever be added to them. The saved are only added to the church that Jesus Christ himself built. Those who are joined to any of these other bodies are without Christ and thus are lost. They are joined only to Satan. Many years ago, my cousin, when she was much younger, her and my grandmother were driving around town, and I forget which denominational building it was, but they drove by, and she pointed, look, Grandma, the devil's church. Now, that's quite simple. And it was funny at the time, and it really still is, but it's true. Look out here at all these different church buildings, meetings of worship, each and every one of them that do not bear the name of Christ their Savior, that do not uphold his gospel, that would include members of the church. They're members of the devil's church if they're a part of the denominations. And they're joined to Satan if they're practicing anything other than the gospel of Christ. Jesus pointed the following out in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, as well as 13 and 14, regarding those who would rather follow a man-made gospel. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That was Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, now verse 13 and 14. But Jesus answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. 
Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. This is our Lord's view of those who would reject his pattern, who would attempt to have Jesus and not the church. No man can put these asunder. Third, God has joined obedience and salvation. We know that faith alone cannot save. This is a vain attempt. James chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, which says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You see, we cannot enter into heaven without doing the will of heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Only those who are authorized to obtain salvation, or excuse me, those who obey are authorized to obtain eternal salvation. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Speaking of Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them all that obey him. Most of the religious world wishes to separate belief from baptism. Yet Jesus bound them together. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. You see, baptism is an act of obedience, just as the other steps are to salvation. But this one seems to be the most attacked, so we'll spend a little bit more time on it. Without obeying the command to be baptized, one cannot enter Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Without being baptized, one cannot enter into the church or the kingdom of God or the body of Christ. These three terms are synonyms. They represent different aspects of the body of the saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. John chapter 3, verse 5, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, as well as Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Without being baptized, one cannot be washed and regenerated. Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Titus chapter 3, verse 5, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Without being baptized, one cannot contact the very blood of their Savior, and thus receive the remission of sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Without this act of baptism, one cannot be buried with Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Without completing this act of baptism, one cannot be risen with Christ and then walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Now, if we claim to love Jesus our Savior, which is indeed a good thing, we must, therefore, obey His will for us. John chapter 14, verse 15, as well as verses 21 through 24. Matthew 28, verse 20. In spite of man's efforts, obedience cannot nor ever will be separated from man's salvation. Next, we consider that God has joined Christ and the doctrine of Christ. Some cry out for the fact that doctrine is not important. I've seen a little bit of it that 
Many are even allergic to the word pattern. Because after all, we can't repeat what those mossbacks did. We have to do something new, something exciting, something different. Oftentimes, it's for the sake of being different. But we see that this is a false claim. It's a false notion. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus himself pointed out, we typically refer to this as the Great Commission. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. But what are we to do? Teaching them to observe all things, all things, whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus gave the pattern of teaching. You teach them all things that I have taught you. This is how we are or supposed to be following the gospel. While it was given to that first century church, those disciples, this ties all believers together. This ties the world together. This gospel is what is to be taught. And ultimately obeyed by all. Then we see that the first century church continued in the apostles' doctrine. Acts chapter 2 verse 42. This was the doctrine of Christ that the apostles taught. We see that Sergius Paulus heard and was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Acts chapter 13 verses 6 through 12. The doctrine of Christ came from our Lord. John chapter 16, verse thir verses 13 through 15. Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. And Hebrews, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Thus, whenever one refuses the doctrine of Christ, they reject the Savior who gave it. We cannot have Christ without his doctrine. Likewise, we cannot have his doctrine without Christ. We cannot have God the Father nor the Son unless we abide in his doctrine. 2 John uh, verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. We must continue in the Lord's word, which is his doctrine. It is the New Testament that we must abide in and follow if we are, able, or if we are to be his disciples. There is no other way. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. It is this New Testament that we must abide in and follow if we are indeed to obtain eternal salvation. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. All who reject this doctrine of Christ in this life will ultimately be rejected by our Savior in the last day. John chapter 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You cannot separate the doctrine of Christ from Christ. Then we consider that God has joined the Holy Spirit and the Bible. I think many times we shy away from the Holy Spirit because so many people have taught so many different kinds of error regarding the Holy Spirit that we run in the opposite direction. While we do, in fact, need to be careful when dealing with this subject, we should also be just as careful in every other subject regarding spiritual matters. But nonetheless, God has joined the Holy Spirit, and the Bible together. The scriptures teach that the Bible, the Word of God, is the product of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. As it shows the list of the armor of God, it comes down to the verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Spirit. 
which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Peter points out in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, that knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of, of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This wasn't some kind of religious experience that happened in Mama's basement. This wasn't something that happened on the mourner's bench in these denominations. This was directed by God, directed by the Holy Ghost. Reference also 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, and Acts chapter 28, verse 25. You see, the Bible does not consist of mere mortal's words. It is the product of divinity. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 reads, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. But unto, but unto us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For who among men knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of the man, which is in him? Even so the things of God none knoweth, save the Spirit of God. But we received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that were freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Spirit teacheth, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. The Holy Spirit guided the apostles into all truth. John chapter 16, verses 7 through 13. In Acts chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 4. It is said of him that he would help the apostles recall those different things that Jesus taught them. John chapter 14, verse 26. The writers of scripture were guided by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2 as well as chapter 11, verse 5, Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, Mark chapter 12, verse 36, Acts chapter 1, verse 16, chapter 4, verse 8, and verse 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, and Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. This is what gives force to Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This word substance comes from the Greek word hypostasis, which means that which stands under. I think for us to visualize this would help if we go look at these overpasses, go look at bridges specifically the older ones that are for trains. The substance here would be those undergirding supports, that substructure that keeps up the bridge that's going to be used to drive across. Faith is that undergirding support. The Word of God brings faith. This faith supports our hope and thus provides the evidence for us to walk by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. The Holy Spirit has provided this for man by making his contribution, by fulfilling his role in the divine scheme of redemption. I'll, let, I'll read that verse again. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Holy Spirit has made that possible by giving us the written word through the hand of man 
the ability for us to have hope and the evidence to know that we can and will walk by faith. We can know different things whether or not we've ever experienced them. This is done by having the eye of faith. Whenever we look at the Bible, whenever we use it in battle, if you will, once you prove the Bible to be of God, which can be done and has been done, it will, must continue to be done to all those who would be skeptics. Once it is proven to be God, or from God rather, it itself becomes evidence. Sufficient evidence contains credible witnesses to arrive at proper conclusions. Ultimately, to be used in battle as the Lord's army to defeat error. To remove the sin from our own lives as we commit it. Now as we draw this lesson to a close, we've considered, we've pointed out rather, that man is strictly forbidden to divide asunder those things which God has joined together. The things we've talked about this morning, man cannot, he is not authorized to divide a man and woman in a scriptural marriage cannot divide Christ from the church, cannot separate obedience from salvation, cannot divide Christ from his doctrine, nor can man separate the Holy Spirit from the Bible. Now if you think about it, it is impossible for man to separate these things. Not only are we not authorized to attempt to do it, but it, we cannot actually separate these things. Why is that? Because, jo because God joined them together. Now, mankind can attempt to do that, but ultimately, man can only lie about dividing these things and perpetuate that lie through his doctrines. Thus, we see the creation of doctrines of men. Each of them, ultimately, are doctrines of the devil. Now, if you wish to see past the lies of these wicked men and become joined to Christ through humble obedience to his word, why not do so this morning? In order to become joined to Christ, you must hear the gospel, which you've heard a portion of this morning, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Following that, you must believe in the deity of Christ, believe in the surety of his word, John chapter 8, verse 24. You must then repent of your past sins, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Confess Christ publicly, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And then result, resulting in baptism for the remission of sins, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. This makes you qualified to enter into the church of Christ. The Lord himself will add you to that church. At this point, you're a member of the body of the saved. You're in the kingdom of God. You're in the church that Jesus died for and purchased with his blood. It doesn't stop there, though. You arise from that grave in baptism to walk in newness of life. Thus, you're expected to carry out the will of heaven, that very doctrine of Christ, to live a faithful and godly life the rest out, throughout the rest of your days. Titus chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Why not make that step today? Now, if you are a member of his body already, have you allowed sin back into your life? Have you stumbled? If indeed that is the case, repent, confess, and pray. These, these small steps will restore you to a proper relationship, will bring you back into fellowship, with your creator. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. If either of these applies to you, why not make the following or take the following moments to make things correct between you and your creator as together we stand and sing.